Hello, and welcome to Women in Business, where we interview entrepreneurs and senior managers and show you the strengths, successes, obstacles, and roadblocks women experience in business. Since I believe every person in business needs to be visible, I'd like to invite you to watch www.sob6, that's the number six, tips.com, which will give you some valuable information should you get the call to be on radio or TV, which I think is extremely important. If you'd like to contact me personally, drop me a line at Gail Carson, that's G-A-Y-L-E, Gail Carson 13 at gmail.com, or go to my website, www.spunkyoldbroad.com, and sign up for my weekly newsletter. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Gail Carson, bringing you Women in Business. And I'd like to make an offer to you today. Um, if you are interested in learning more about uh, me and about the uh, shows and if you would like to maybe contribute to who you'd like to see on the show or have a conversation about with me about anything in your mind at all just go to spunkyoldbroad.com that's my website fill out the contact board tell me what you'd like to talk about and I'll call you when we'll get together and see what's happening but I have a great great guest for you today uh, HV MacArthur formerly known as Heather. She brings over 20 years of experience in helping employees blaze fulfilling career paths in an ever-changing work landscape. From serving in the military to carving out her role as a coach and a consultant for Fortune 500 companies, she's built her expertise from hard-fought career choices. In her new book, Low Man on the Totem Pole, Stop Begging for a Promotion, Start Selling Your Genius, she helps people from all walks of life, from C-suite leaders to employees on the factory floor, learn to identify their unique callings and find their greatness. Well, welcome to the show, Heather. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. I appreciate it. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, you, let's find first about your uh, military experience. What was that like? When was that? What did you do? What branch of the service? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I was. Uh, I served in the Air Force for four years as a Russian linguist for the NSA, which um, sounds very exciting. Um, but then when you add that I was there 95 to 99, that's before right in between things being exciting. <laughs> um, but that's but not easy. Was, Russian's a tough language. It, it was, um, it, you know, oddly enough, it turned out that I'm really good at, at memorizing patterns. And so language just kind of uh, was an easy uh, pickup for me, but it was definitely a, a tough language to learn, but um, really great schools and training. And that was probably my first exposure to uh, what real uh, well done, efficient training is like is uh, the programs that they had there. So when, when Putin comes on and says something, you know whether the translator is doing it correctly or not, correct? Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's funny is I'm actually much better at listening. Uh, that's why I always have a lot of respect for people who speak a second language, because listening and translating is one thing. Being able to speak it fluently, to be able to think of the next word to come up and, and to say it, I think is a, is a whole other level. So when, when someone says, you know, if someone's kind of like, oh, well, you know, they, they speak two languages, they have, an, you know, they have an accent, it's hard to understand them. I'm like, at the fact that they're speaking another language on top of the one they already speak, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, I am too. So there you go. But uh, <laughs> low man on the totem pole. Um, you know, that's, that's I love the, the title, low man on the totem pole. And then stop begging for a promotion and start selling your genius. How did all of that come to be? Well, you know, I, I've always been, uh, you know, I, I worked from, from uh, very kind of hourly positions on through leadership positions, and I never considered any of those jobs uh, beneath me or the wrong job. Um, and at one point, I was coaching a lot and working with people, and, and people would always say, well, you know, don't you want the top C-suite only? That's, that's a career move. And I just thought, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm helping people. And one day... Um, a friend of mine, we were picking up her daughter from school, and she had had art class, and they drew a totem pole. And, I, and me and my sarcastic, you know, tone, I said to her mom, I said, oh, you know, her mom said, oh, what did you draw today? And I said, oh, she drew you, the low man on the totem pole. We're joking around with each other. 
And her daughter, who's just such a bright light, uh, said, uh, actually, we learned today that the very bottom of the totem pole was the most important. It's the foundation. And it's it was seen as, you know, hire the best artist to do that piece. And I, I loved that, especially since we've had it wrong for so long, that it's, it's horrible to be on the bottom and somehow it's beneath us. And the reality is, no matter where you're at, you know, if you take pride in that, you're the foundation to everything going on. And that's where I... I really kind of started with this. Well, how do you stop getting on that hamster wheel and begging for the cheese of a promotion and just get into that concept of what are you up to in life and how are you using work to get there? Yeah, I mean, that is a, I thought, I think that's a great way to look at it because it is true. You know, you need the foundation and uh, the fact that um, they think of the low man on the totem pole as the foundation, it just shows you the, uh, Native cultures, how how much smarter they are than we are sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so, so you know, you advise employees to view themselves as business owners, even though they work for someone else. Um, that's not easy for a lot of people to do. What happens when employees do make this shift, and how easy is it for them, and what kind of success have you seen in that? You know, it, it, it really is just a flip of the switch, but the, but people are kind of mistaken to think that they're employees versus business owners. Everyone's a business owner. You might file your taxes differently, and you might have negotiated away some of the risk with the larger company that you're working with, but you're a business owner. And, I you know, I discovered that when I started consulting, and I've, I've gone internal and external a few times, um, but the first time I was consulting, I realized, I'm better when I show up uh, as a partner with people and I'm not in this mindset of an employee. When I get others to kind of get their mind wrapped around that, they stop being um, kind of caught up in this thing around what a manager should do for them, what a company should do for them, because it, it, employees have kind of taught that they're supposed to be cared for by, the, by their companies, which I get, you know, back in the day it was let's keep employees around for as long as possible uh, because that was where all the knowledge was. And that's changed. You know, that kind of job security doesn't really, you know, exist anymore. And I, it's just smarter to remember you're actually this business person. And that means your manager is your primary client. And it's, what I find is when people start to think of things that way, they get much more curious about their manager. They spend less time gauging whether or not their manager is skilled at what they do. We don't care if our customers are skilled at what they do. They're not supposed to be. That's why they pay us. And so when a manager is not good at something, we don't see that as a failure. We see that as an opportunity of, great, now I have something I can sell my services for. And instead of waiting for someone to promote me as a business owner, I don't wait for the client to invite me to do something else for them. I pitch, I sell, I influence people. I don't wait for the headcount to show up. So there's less waiting, there's less uh, resentment, and there's more empowerment. So when, when people are, are in this position, uh, many of them try to look good for the boss. I mean, you know, they call that brown nosing, right? <laughs> but you say this can actually undercut performance. So why is that? I mean, there are bosses that have favorites. There's no question because the person is reliable. They do a good job. They know when they tell them to do something, it gets done. But what about, you know, how can an employee try to look good for a boss and then have it backfire? Well, I, I, you know, really at the end of the day, the looking good kind of strategy of I need to look good sets us up to, to come from a fear based place. So what we're really focused on is are, you know, are we approved of by managers? And on one hand, it sets us up where we might not have the right conversations. We might not suggest something that really, really sets our manager up for a better position because it goes against what they said. That's why the higher up you go, the more yes people you have. The other side of it is, is everybody else knows if you're full of it. And eventually that, you know, you erode the relationships around you. You, you just in this collaborative work world, you can't get as much done. And instead of trying to look good, just be good at what you're doing. And it's more of a focus of, what I like to call strategic and helpful. And that, you know, it does take a lot of confidence. It does take a lot of sense of there's enough opportunity to go around and things are going to work out. So if that was a guarantee, what would I say in this meeting? What would I, what would I share in this meeting? It would be about helping everybody elevate, including yourself. And it would be about having 
you know, calling out the unpopular idea if it's the right thing to call out, but you do it in a respectful way versus a resentful, well, you guys should listen to me kind of way. And you just show up as your best self. And sometimes you're not for everybody. And, you know, you got to sit back and recognize maybe this particular person or organization is not ready for what I'm bringing or doesn't need what I bring. Let me go to where I'm needed. But it's not this kick in the ego of there's favorites or whatever. Of course, people, people like things that feel good to them. So if they've got someone who makes them feel successful, I mean, that's the whole reason we have certain brands we love. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, what are you up to? What do you want to deliver? And are you doing that? Or are you getting caught up in fear-based decisions, ego-based decisions? You know, it, it, it's interesting because um, I still know a lot of people who look at other people in their organizations and say, that person always tries to kind of snuggle up to the boss, you know, not in those terms, but tries to, you know, oh, I'm the one that can do everything and I'm your, I'm your fair haired boy or girl. So, um, you know, it still exists, but you're absolutely right. Collaboration is the name of the game today. And the more collaborative you are, the healthier the company is going to be. So, uh, but it's, boy, it's not easy getting some people on that wavelength. So, how how would I know if my career was off track? I mean, what are the warning signs other than getting written up or, you know, being told you don't do something well? I mean, how do I, I know and how do I know if I'm being left behind? You know, I, I, I think there's two things there. I, I, I'll, I'll tackle the, the, the last one first. Is I, don't, I don't think anybody gets left behind. I, I, I get that there's a lot of talk around um, what happens as you get older and there's only so much time. And I think when you're climbing a ladder and you're trying to get promoted vertically as fast as possible, then it's easy to feel like that. But to really, once again, I go back to, if you're a business owner, you're building a business in, in you can, there's so much opportunity out there, especially now with technology where you're not just stuck to customers that are in your geographical area either. And, and companies that are in your geographical area, there's just, I, I don't focus on what, you know, being left behind. It's more about going back to, are you clear as to what you want? And you'll figure out what's worth the sacrifice and what's not. And in, in terms of, you know, knowing whether or not it's time to do a shift in your career, I really go back down to energy. How much energy are you getting back in return? And sometimes you could be doing something amazing for others. And for whatever reason, it's just not feeding you anymore. And, You've got to sit with, and what I usually tell people is, is to, to go on a journey of kind of three phases, is if you feel that kind of like I, I'm, I'm getting frustrated with where I'm at or I'm just not as satisfied, some of it might be burnout. You just need a vacation. Um, but if that's not the case, then spend some time doing exploratory mode, meaning keep a journal, pay attention to what kind of things do you see and notice that gives an emotional charge from you. For a while, I was just noticing that I'd come 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 back to the building I was working in and I'd see these people jogging in the middle of the day and I'd get angry like how dare they jog in the middle of the day and <laughs> I you know I would take note of that and finally like after a couple of things what I realized is I was looking for just a broader scope of freedom and you know after paying attention to other things and really listening to myself it came down to oh it's time for me to go back to consulting I haven't jog jogged once in the middle of the day even though I could what I realized it wasn't the jogging it was just the freedom to really dictate my schedule that I was hungry for and um, and so you know in exploratory mode you never know what you're going to find it's hard because you don't know what you want but it's fun because there's no risk in it you're just listening to yourself the next phase is um, research mode. You're starting to figure out what it is that you want. Now you have to start to talk to people and research what does it take to do it. And it's a little riskier because you're letting people know this is what you're interested in, but it's, 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 it's a little bit more certain so we feel better about it. And then the third phase is now it's time to take action. You, you figured out what you want. You figured out a few steps to make it happen. This is the highest risk version of it because now you got to put some skin in the game. It's also the most certain. So there's pluses and minuses for each stage. But I always find that people in exploratory stage are frustrated the most because they think they're supposed to be in action mode only their whole life. And that's just not true. You know, um, it's so funny you talk about, you know, <laughs> seeing someone jogging in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> Isn't it very interesting how 
we always want something we don't have, and then when we have it, we don't want it. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, it's really interesting. You know, it just looks so great, and then when it happens, it's not something we want at all. So um, we've got to get the job we want first in the first place. So you talk about some of the top mistakes people make when they are being interviewed. What are some of the major ones? I can think of, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years when I had my first company because it, it got to be pretty large. What, what do you say are the top mistakes? You know, the, very, the first one and the prime one that I right. see, and I, and I understand where it comes from, is that but we just go in so desperate to sell ourselves as the right person for the job. And it ends up being a very one-sided interview. And I, I, you know, even if you're 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 tight on money and you really need the job, the best way to go in is to treat it. I always say treat it like a date. It should be this two-way thing. Is not just am I good for this job, but are you good for me? Is this environment going to be good for me? You have to treasure the skills you're bringing to the table, your your work ethic, your passion, and not that you're better than anyone else but that you're walking in with this, you know, I'm going to do good work and I want to make sure that that gift is given to an organization that's going to leverage that in the right way and support it in the right way. And I think when you show up that way, you ask different questions, you show up with a different level of confidence and it ends up feeling less as this desperate plea for a job and more for this is, are we a good match or not? And if not, let's, let's move on to the next, next candidate. You know, I think that's, um, I, I like that. I like that. But I, you know, I wonder sometimes if you go in with that attitude, for instance, if somebody is, uh, if I'm interviewing somebody and they say to me, well, you know, tell me a little bit about your organization. I want to make sure that I'm a good fit for you. Uh, and I want to make sure this is really a place that I can sink my heart and soul into. Um, I wonder if that sets off a uh, well, who the heck do you think you are kind of thing? Or um, who are you to be asking me? You're here for the job. You should have done the research on the company already. Where does that come in? You know, I, I think, one, if you're, if you're really coming from a place of, um, you know, listening to them and looking to partner with them, I don't think that's the vibe that, that comes off. I think if you go in there and going like, well, what do you guys have? And I, I only do this and I don't do this then I agree, then that's not somebody that I want to hire because you're coming in with this kind of sense of entitlement. But I think coming in and going, I, I really want to be thoughtful about this. If someone's put off by that, then I've probably flushed out an issue that's going to be worse when I get there. And I, and, and, and trust me, I get needing, in a, being in a position where, look, I need the job. I need the paycheck. Things are tight. And if, if it's the worst environment in the world, I don't care at this point. I need the job. But even then, when you go in with that, there's a level of desperation that is just all over everything that you're doing. But if you walk in and you value what you do, you care about the people you want to do that for, I don't think that's the vibe that comes across. Something else that I'd say is the other mistake that we make is assuming that all we should be talking about is what our past and our background. And the reality is no one honestly cares. They're trying to gauge how to make a good decision and gamble on hiring somebody who's not going to screw things up. And by all means, give them whatever level of background that you need to. They've got your resume. But when you get to the asking of questions, before I jump in and I start asking questions about what kind of environment it is and is it going to be a good fit for me, I just I ask them some simple questions like, what would tell you in 90 days from now that you hired the right person? Um, I, I want to elevate their, their thinking about whether or not they've got the right person. You've done a service just by that. And then I try to ask them questions of what they've got going on so that maybe even in that short conversation, there might be some nugget that I'm able to help with because I want them to experience this is what it would be like if you were working with me. I would be trying to figure out how to help you. I'd be trying to figure out how to solve things. And then I go into let me understand what this environment is like so I can make sure it's a good fit uh, for both of us. And I think that way you're always leading with, I'm going to give service first and then, you know, come in asking for the trade on that. I think that's just good business. That's interesting. I really would like to see how most people do their interviews, both on the uh, interviewer side and the interviewee side to see how much of this is really 
happening. But <laughs> anyway, I um, will tell you, I will tell you that most most Joe are when I've gone in for interviews and I ask them what what would tell them that they've hired the right person. Ninety percent of the time, they've said, "Huh, good question," <laughs> and they have to think about it. Because yeah. they haven't thought that far along no. on it, but they do enjoy the question. And so I think when you come with that and there's a humility in you, it's not taken the wrong way. That's great. I, I like that way of approaching it. What are you looking for, you know, and can I bring that to you? I think that's a great way of doing it. So yeah. um, you also um, say that even the most skilled among us, so I'm going to say the most talented among us, overvalue what we do best and that's kind of sometimes a dichotomy I mean if we do something really 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 well uh, maybe we should value it very highly so where do you come in on that I you know I I think you should value what you bring to the table quite a bit um, because if you don't why would anybody else but I think um, what we do uh, is one thing, but how we do it ends up being the marker of whether or not people want to work with us again. And so there's times where I've coached people who are just the best in the business as to what they do, but no one can stand them. And, um, it, or no one knows that they exist because they're, they don't want to, you know, push themselves into a situation. And I just go back to your ability to work with others it's not the same as before where you could stay in the same position forever and people have to kind of get used to you. And I've seen a lot of people who kind of are leaders um, or are people who are in in key positions that just rely on the fact that people have to bend towards their style. And because of the rapid uh, pace of change and reorganization, now what really is a competitive edge is be good at your job, but can I pluck you? And put you into groups anywhere at any time, and you can quickly build a sense of team with them, and they trust you, and they want to work with you, and there's no drama. And I I find that sometimes from the past work environments, people have just gotten too comfortable with, as long as I'm the best at what I do, people have to put up with anything I, I, I show up with. Well, that's certainly true. So how can people get in touch with you, Heather? And I would also like to know how you... Um, position yourself as HV versus Heather. Was there a psychology in that? Uh, there was a little bit. It was mainly um, uh, one. I just I like my last name, and two. Um, uh, in all honesty, a lot of times the business books that are written by women are seen as business books about women in business, and I don't have anything against that. But I was like, this is just a business book, and and I didn't want that. I didn't want my name to be the focus. I didn't want my gender to be the focus. I just wanted the work to be the focus. So. I did a little J.K. Rowling and, and uh, <laughs> did the H.C. McArthur. And if it works for her, it's good enough for you, right? <laughs> uh, right. I'll, I'll definitely follow that draft. <laughs> okay. So where can people find you and where can they get your book? And do you have something you'd like to offer to the listeners? Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, by all means, the, the book is available on Amazon and Kindle and uh, soft copy um, under Low Men on the Totem Pole. You can look up H.V. MacArthur. Also, I've got a bunch of articles um, uh, on my uh, column with uh, Forbes, so you can look up H.V. MacArthur with Forbes, and there's articles if, you're, if you prefer a shorter, a shorter read than the long read. And also, um, I do a, a little uh, podcast of my own under Low Men on the Totem Pole that they can check out as well. Fabulous. That all sounds great. So again, remember, it's, um, uh, it's Heather MacArthur, but remember the the website is lowmanonthetotempole.com, and her name, MacArthur, is M-A-C, not M-C, M-A-C, MacArthur, and uh, she has all her information there, and you can find out more about her there, and remember, if you'd like to have a conversation with me, or if you have a suggestion for the shows, or uh, anything along those lines, any guests you'd like me to invite, uh, just uh, go to the website, uh, fill out the contact form, and uh, get it to me, and I'll get back to you ASAP. So um, we have just like about 30, 40 seconds left. Heather, is there anything you'd like to add to all of this? Um, you know, I, 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 I always like to throw out just being kind to yourself. I, I, we, work can be so stressful. I just like to send that message. Please be gentle with yourself as you're kind of navigating some of the ups and downs of it. 
Well, that is true. We like to beat up on ourselves. Either we, we, we grandize too much or we beat up too much. It's not seems to be <laughs> no happy medium. What can I say? But, you know, I love the idea. Remember, low man on the totem pole, that bottom, that bottom part of the totem pole is the foundation. So never neglect that. That's really an important part. And uh, you want to make sure that, that that is a part of what you're doing. Well, I hope that um, this is very successful for you, and I hope that uh, uh, you continue to do all the great work that you're doing, Heather, because people need people like you, and it makes a big difference. So thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Women in Business. I hope you enjoyed today's show, and if you have any suggestions as to who you'd like me to have as a guest, just email me at gailcarson13 at gmail.com. Be sure to check out www.sob6tips.com. And in the meantime, go to www.spunkyoldbroad.com to see the resources I have for you.